Alzheimer's is a very big problem. It affects about 35 million people worldwide, and this number is expected to triple by the year 2050. So it's been on the rise for decades, and it appears that it's going to continue to rise. However, uh, there was a speaker a couple of years ago at an international Alzheimer's conference who stated that if, since this is a disease mainly of the elderly, that if a treatment could be fine, found that could delay the onset of the disease by five years, it could cut that number of cases in half. So um, hopefully uh, there, some treatment will come along and this potentially could be one of them. <laughs> Uh, a lot of <clears throat> attention has been fo focused on plaques and tangles, which were discovered by Dr. Alzheimer many years ago and are considered to be the hallmarks of the disease and what are looked for at autopsy to confirm that someone had um, Alzheimer's disease. And uh, great, it's been assumed you know, for many years that these plaques are the cause of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and so research has been uh, poured into uh, looking for medications that would help reduce this amyloid plaque or prevent further buildup of amyloid plaque uh, vaccines and other oral medications. Um, but so far, none of them have proven to be of any benefit um, in Alzheimer's disease. <clears throat> um, it's no doubt that the plaques um, play an important role in Alzheimer's. This is a very interesting technique that was used to look at normal wild-type mice uh, versus um, an Alzheimer model of uh, mice. And what they did was inject the vascular tree with a plastic substance and dissolve the other tissue surrounding it. And um, you can see, I don't know if this has a pointer on it, um, that you, know, you can see the sticky plaques up there in the middle um, frame and uh, a magnified image of it in which you can see actual indentation from these sticky plaques in the blood vessel walls. And you can see, compared to the wild-type uh, mouse on your far left, uh, that the, um, in the Alzheimer mouse, this vascular tree is highly disrupted. And you can imagine that a similar process is happening to the neurons and the nerve pathways in the brain as well as a result of this amyloid plaque. So you know, it, it goes to uh, reason that you know, this is uh, toxic and damaging to the brain. However, is it the cause of, or is it a downstream effect of something else that's causing Alzheimer's disease? And it still really isn't known at this point. Um, <clears throat> recently, the beta amyloid PET scan was developed. Um, it, previously, a person could only be confirmed as having Alzheimer's by autopsy. And so uh, this uh, shows um, accumulation of beta amyloid in the brain. And so the yellow and red areas are where beta amyloid uptake is occurring. And on the left, you can see um, these are three brains of uh, people who are clinically diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And on the right are brains of people who are clinically normal, that don't have cognitive impairment. And you can see that there's some overlap there. The brain on the top right of a normal person appears to have considerable um, amyloid plaque. Uh, the one on the lower left of someone with clinical Alzheimer's doesn't seem to have as much as this normal person. So um, it may not actually tell the whole story. <clears throat> so another important aspect of Alzheimer's disease that hasn't gotten nearly as much attention is that it appears to be a type of diabetes of the brain, that there's a problem with glucose metabolism in the brain. And the earliest reports I've been able to find of this was um, published in a German medical journal, uh, Dr. Siegfried Hoyer who uh, first reported that uh, there appeared to be, or there was decreased glucose uptake, uh, glucose levels and lower cerebral metabolic rates in the brains of some people with dementia. And he and his associates went on to study this. They have studied this for many years and published many articles um, about uh, glucose metabolism, insulin resistance, and other aspects of this problem in Alzheimer's disease. And uh, other groups throughout the world have as well. Um, but I wanted to focus just on one group here uh, from Brown University, led by Dr. Suzanne Delamonte. And they looked at the brains of people with advanced Alzheimer's disease who did not have type 1 or type 2 diabetes. And what they found was that the levels of insulin and factors related to making and using insulin are greatly reduced 
that all of the signaling pathways involved in the use of energy are abnormal, and that the functioning of mitochondria is abnormal in Alzheimer's disease. And they coined the term type 3 diabetes. This was in 2005 um, to describe the insulin deficiency and insulin resistance in the uh, brains of people with Alzheimer's. Um, this group went on to um, study at uh, the brains of people at various stages of the disease, and they found that it was present in the very earliest stages and that it became more progressive and more widespread throughout the brain um, as the disease progressed until it was very severe in the last stages of the disease. <clears throat> so there's a fundamental problem in Alzheimer's disease of, of getting uh, glucose into the brain, and it's not just insulin resistance and insulin deficiency. Um, there, is a report, there are reports that there's a deficiency of the uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase complex and also deficiencies of GLUT1 and GLUT3 uh, glucose transporters that uh, get glucose into the brain and into neurons. So it seems like there's a conspiracy of getting glucose into the brain and brain cells of people with Alzheimer's disease. Um, Dr. Kunain showed a, a similar s uh, slide um, when he spoke uh, the other evening. Um, <clears throat> and here on the left is a, a normal brain, and the yellow and red areas are areas where, of glucose uptake, and blue is where there's very low uptake. And you can see in the Alzheimer brain on the right that there's a considerable reduction in the amount of glucose uh, taken up in the brain. So um, uh, glucose PET scans have been done um, on people as early as their 20s that are at risk for Alzheimer's disease um, who are clinically normal at that time. Uh, but they show that there is already decreased glucose uptake as early as people in their 20s. And um, it's been shown over and over that uh, this problem appears to occur possibly uh, decades before the onset of symptoms. So uh, we know that uh, glucose is the predominant fuel for most cells, including the brain, in the normal fed state, and especially when on the typical diet, especially the typical American diet. <laughs> Um, however, during starvation, humans easily switch over to using alternative fuels after glucose stores are used up, and these include amino acids and lactate um, by way of gluconeogenesis, um, fatty acids, which are used by um, muscles, uh, cardiac muscle, um, uh, but do not cross the blood-brain barrier, the long-chain fatty acids, and uh, ketones, uh, which are produced uh, in the liver from uh, fatty acids which do cross the blood-brain barrier and can be used by the brain as alternative fuel. So uh, the brain has metabolic flexibility. It can uh, very easily switch over from using glucose to ketones um, to uh, create, uh, uh, end up uh, for making ATP. So the question then becomes, <clears throat> could ketones bypass the fundamental problem of getting glucose into the brain by providing alternative fuel in Alzheimer's disease. And uh, the first publication, the first person that I have read uh, of who has suggested this is Dr. R Richard Veach of the NIH. He's been studying, uh, he's an um, MD, PhD, and he's uh, biochemistry is his forte. Uh, he's been with the NI NIH for decades, and he began studying ketones in the 1990s. And he, um, did a study in which they had cultures of neurons that, to which they subjected uh, toxins that cause Alzheimer's disease and cause Parkinson's disease. And in some of the cultures, they had beta-hydroxybutyrate, the ketone body, and in other cultures, they did not. And what they found was that there were many more surviving neurons in the cultures that had beta-hydroxybutyrate. So um, he has been developing a ketone ester basically since the 1990s. Um, with the hypothesis that, um, that raising ketone levels uh, could potentially, as, and using them as alternative fuel, could bypass this problem of um, glucose metabolism in the brain of people with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, MS, ALS, um, any number of other neurodegenerative disease, diseases. Um, congestive heart failure could improve um, the uh, 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 cardiac, uh, it has, uh, they, they showed uh, increased, um, um, let's see, how do you put it, work of uh, heart in, um, prior to this study. <coughs> anyway, um, so around 2000, he published this, and um, 
Then uh, 2001 to 2003, he began publishing some hypothesis articles. And uh, Dr. George Cahill uh, published articles with him. Um, Dr. Cahill had discovered that the brain uses ketones as alternative fuel during starvation and published this in the 1960s. Uh, Dr. Theodore Van Italy, who is 96 now and still publishing, um, he published a hi hypothesis uh, paper about uh, the use of ketones. They're all um, um, colleagues over the years. Um, Dr. Van Italy uh, had discovered that medium chain triglyceride oil when taken up when, by the liver is partly converted to ketones. So um, they all believe firmly that um, ketones could be used as alternative fuel to um, bypass this problem of um, insulin resistance and, and problem of getting glucose into brain cells. So we heard from Dr. Kunain, so this is much more recent research now, um, some evidence that this actually may be the case. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Kunain uh, presented his work and he showed that uh, uh, he has the only ketone PET scanner in the world now, and that's about to change. There's one more <laughs> that's about to be available here in the US. Um, but he does uh, ketone and glucose PET scans in people who are normal and people with Alzheimer's disease. And he looked at people with mild Alzheimer's disease and compared to the controls, he found that, in fact, glucose uptake is 17% lower in the gray matter overall and 25% lower in areas affected by Alzheimer's. This is already in mild Alzheimer's disease. Uh, however, in these very same areas that uh, previously uh, it was thought that the neurons were likely dead, and that's why they were not taking up glucose, that in fact they take up ketones normally. So this implies that the neurons, you know, um, some of them may be gone, but that uh, neurons may potentially still be there. Uh, sort of like cars just waiting for their gas tank to be filled up with a fuel. Um, and uh, that, you know, these areas may not necessarily be completely dead. So potentially, ketones could be used as an alternative fuel in uh, Alzheimer's disease. So <clears throat> we've seen this and similar, you know, similar slides to this throughout the conference, so I don't need to um, talk about it a lot, but, you know, there are many ways to raise ketone levels. Uh, one is starvation or fasting, which is not very practical for somebody with Alzheimer's disease. Um, and ketogenic diet, uh, especially a very strict ketogenic diet, may be difficult, you know, to, uh, in very elderly people, it can be done, but um, uh, if there are other ways. Vigorous exercise can raise ketones. And then medium chain triglycerides, as I mentioned, as well as ketone esters, ketone salts. Uh, there's a ketone triglyceride that's um, in development. And, so there are other ways um, to potentially raise ketone levels, and uh, here are some, some of them, and there are ways to also measure whether you are in ketosis. So these are just, um, give you an idea of the, the levels uh, that you see with the various strategies. Um, none of them come anywhere close to approaching the levels of ketosis that happen with diabetic ketoacidosis. And that's a big concern that doctors often bring up when their patients wanna do this. Um, but uh, it's very unusual, I think it would be very unusual and rare to actually tip somebody over into diabetic ketoacidosis by employing one of these strategies. So now I'm going to go back to a time before I knew any of this <laughs> and tell you um, our story. Um, <clears throat> I am a neonatologist, as Dom Dominic said, that's a doctor that cares for sick and premature newborns, and uh, that's my husband, Steve. And he uh, worked as an accountant from home for my practice so that he could be there for my children. <clears throat> but in 2001, when he was only 51 years old, he began having problems. Um, he was making big payroll mistakes. He procrastinating and not getting uh, taxes filed on time. Um, and then he began having problems remembering if he'd been to the bank in the post office. And I thought, you know, I'm only two years younger than him. I, I wouldn't forget that. Um, and at first, his physician attributed it to depression, but things continued to get worse, and, and actually fairly steadily. And by 2004, he was officially diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease um, by a local neurologist, and we had that confirmed at the um, uh, Alzheimer, Bird Alzheimer Institute here at USF. Um, by 2006, he could no longer do any accounting. He couldn't uh, use a calculator or even remember how to turn on a computer. 
So he had uh, went from a guy who used the computer all day long, if he wasn't working on it, he was playing on it, to not even be, being able to remember how to turn it on. Um, <coughs> he also stopped driving <coughs> around 2006. Um, he stopped reading. He couldn't really explain why, and he did later that he had a visual disturbance. He said the words were jumping around on the page when he would try to read. So he, he gave up on reading, which was one of his major pastimes. Um, by 2008, he was really on a downward spiral. He had problems with finding words, spelling simple words, and even completing sentences. And his jaw would tremor when he would try to talk and finish the sentence. Um, he didn't recognize certain relatives, uh, brothers-in-law, you know, by name. Um, his gait had become slow and weird. <laughs> he would pick his feet up um, abnormally, and he couldn't physically pick up his feet and run anymore. Um, he also had an intention tremor when he tried to eat. Um, he had trouble getting the food up to his mouth. Uh, he was very distractible, and instead of um, cutting the grass, he would take his tractor apart, and I'd find it in pieces. Um, a carburetor and air filter, you know, here, there, and everywhere. Um, he also became very depressed. Um, his personality and sense of humor were fading at that point. So um, we were, you know, quite desperate, and there really hadn't been any clinical trials available that he could qualify for up to this point. However, um, in May of 2008, <coughs> sorry. <laughs> The um, Bird Institute had, was beginning a study with a vaccine <clears throat> that um, helps remove beta amyloid plaque from the brain. <clears throat> it was a second uh, vaccine. The first one had shown inflammation in the brain, and that study was discontinued. And <clears throat> this one was to you know, help remove the amyloid plaque from the brain. And he um, uh, screened for the study, and he met all the criteria except that he got a very low score on the mini mental status exam, score of 12, and he needed at least 16 to qualify out of 30 points. And so we were quite disappointed, as you might imagine, uh, because this seemed like our only hope at the time. And we were told to come back a couple weeks later. And in the meantime, I learned of another drug that was about to start um, clinical trials uh, called semigasostat. And it's an oral medication that was believed to help prevent further buildup of amyloid plaque in the brain. So both of these looked extremely hopeful to us, and we were grateful that we might be, you know, um, in some of the earliest people to get to have this drug, even though you know, there was a risk that we would get placebo. So he was scheduled to have screenings for these uh, clinical trials on uh, two successive days. And the night before um, the first screening, I thought, you know, what, uh, what if he gets accepted into both trials? I want to know something about the risks and the benefits now to help us decide, you know, what to do. So I got online looking uh, for these two drugs, and I just happened upon a press release um, for another uh, treatment. And this was a medical food called AC1202 at that time that was shown to significantly improve the memory and cognition in nearly half of the Alzheimer's patients that took it. And they were talking about uh, just a single dose of this um, treatment, and they didn't say what it was or how it worked. So I got curious, and I found their patent application online, and here they talked about the use of MCT oil, medium-chain triglyceride oil, in Alzheimer's disease. And basically, um, Dr. Sam Henderson filed this patent application in 2000, which was right around the same time Dr. Veach had published his paper about um, the protective effect of beta-hydroxybutyrate um, to neurons. Uh, that were subjected to toxins with Park, uh, that caused Parkinson's or Alzheimer's. And he, his mother had died with Alzheimer's disease. And he um, had the brilliant insight that possibly the mild ketosis that occurs by um, consuming medium chain fatty acids could potentially produce cognitive improvement in the insulin resistant Alzheimer's brain in people with Alzheimer's. And so he embarked on um, developing this prescription medical food. And um, this rang a bell with me. Um, MCT oil was familiar to me because I'm a neonatologist. I think if I wasn't a neonatologist, I might, this might have completely uh, missed this. Um, but uh, medium chain triglycerides are found in human breast milk. They make up about 10 to 17% of the fats in human breast milk. And babies are in ketosis that breastfeed. Um, in the early part of their life. Um, MCT oil 
at the point that I was training in the newborn ICU was we were adding it to the feedings of our very premature newborns um, to uh, help them gain weight faster and they tolerated it very well and uh, eventually was added to directly to infant formulas to create premature infant formulas and to this day you know virtually every infant formula that you see in the United States has MCT oil in it so um, again, uh, the medium chains are taken up by the liver and they easily cross the blood brain, well, they, they're partly converted to ketones, which cross the blood brain barrier. Another interesting fact about medium chains is that they themselves cross the blood brain barrier and can uh, be uh, potentially contributing as well as an alternative fuel to the brain. You know, there's some evidence to support that and a lot more work needs to be done uh, for that um, to prove it. But, um, it's just an interesting idea that this could be used. And so one thing I learned from the patent application that I didn't know uh, before was that MCT oil was extracted from coconut oil, and it's also sometimes extracted from palm kernel oil. So um, <clears throat> Dr. Henderson and his group had done uh, some studies to, to try to get um, recognition by the FDA as a medical food, and the first was a study of 20 people in which each person served as their own control. So uh, one time that they came, they got 40 grams of MCT oil, and the other time they got placebo. And what they found was in nine out of these 20 people, almost half, that just with a single dose of MCT oil, that they had a significant improvement in their memory and cognitive uh, testing. So um, they found that um, uh, people who were AP, uh, apolipoprotein E4, which is a common um, uh, genetic marker in people that have Alzheimer's disease that they did not seem to improve um, as a group, but some individuals did improve. Um, and they found that um, this amount of MCT oil increased beta hydroxybutyrate levels to about 0.5 millimoles. So they went on to do a second study. Um, this was 152 people who had mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease, and uh, it was, the study was performed over 90 days, and they found again that nearly half of the people had um, improvement in their cognitive um, and memory testing. And they found that the highest scores occurred in uh, people who were dosage compliant and in those with the highest beta hydroxybutyrate ketone levels. <clears throat> so um, AC1202 was approved or recognized by the FDA as a medical food, uh, prescription medical food in the spring of 2009. It came out as Axona. Um, and however, this was uh, spring of 2009. This was a year later than when I'm looking at all of this on the internet um, and trying to figure out something that I might be able to do to help my husband. So um, I'm back in May of 2008 and this is about 1 a.m. in the morning and he's about to be screened for a clinical trial uh, that morning and I didn't have time to run out and get coconut oil. I didn't know MCT oil was available over the counter but it has been for many years and um, so we went to the screening, and Steve uh, screened for the, again, the MMSE test, and he scored uh, low uh, 14 out of 30 points and did not qualify for the trial. And uh, the doctor asked him to draw a clock, and when he drew this clock that doesn't really look anything like a clock, she told me that he was on the verge of severe Alzheimer's disease. So um, naturally, uh, we were quite devastated. And um, all I could think was, what do we have to lose? I'm gonna go get some coconut oil, which seemed almost like a ridiculous idea at the time, but the science made sense to me when I read through the patent application and about diabetes of the brain and insulin resistance and ketones as a, you know, hypothetically, you know, an alternative fuel to the brain. So I thought, I'm just gonna pick up a jar. So we came to Tampa, we went to what's Whole Foods now. And, um, when we got home, <clears throat> I just read everything I could about ketones, medium chain triglycerides, reminding myself of basic chemistry 101. I remembered hearing about ketones, you know, used by the brain during starvation and about um, CT oil being converted to ketones. It was not new to me, that part of it. Um, but <clears throat> what I was able to find out um, from basically a fatty acid composition that I found on a government website was that if you consider um, the six carbon to 12 carbon chains as medium chain triglycerides. A coconut oil is about 60%, 60% medium chain triglycerides. And so I figured out how much coconut oil 
I thought we needed to give him to provide a dose equivalent to uh, the AC1202 dose that they use in their clinical trials, which was 20 grams, and came up with 35 grams, which is a little over two tablespoons. So the next morning, um, Steve was uh, scheduled to be screened at one in the afternoon at the Bird Institute, and uh, I put 35 grams of coconut oil in oatmeal because it's semi-solid at room temperature. And we went for the screening, and whereas the day before he couldn't remember the season or the day of the week or what floor he was on, um, he remembered those things, and he scored 18 out of 30 points, and he actually qualified for the study. <laughs> so uh, naturally, we were ecstatic, and at the time, you know, I thought, is it really the coconut oil or was it just good luck? But we're going to continue this just in case. And so um, I started giving him basically a measured dose of at least 35 grams of coconut oil at breakfast and then started cooking with it throughout the day. Um, and <clears throat> what we saw was uh, first, you know, Steve said that the light switch came on the day he started the coconut oil and that his fog lifted. That was something he told me over and over. Um, he had been very sluggish in the morning, barely talking. He couldn't find a, a spoon. He would look over and over in the drawer, you know, for a utensil, and he just couldn't pick out the right one. Um, but we saw that he had more energy. He was much more alert and talkative. His sense of humor and his, the animation in his face came back. It, people with Alzheimer's often look, they have a very dull expression, and, and that came back. Um, and he was no longer seemed depressed, and he actually expressed hope for the future. He said, I feel like I have a future again. Mm -hmm. Um, his facial tremor went away right away. Um, he had the intention tremor occasionally. We would see it in the morning before he has coconut oil and it would go away 20 or 30 minutes after. So it really appeared that this was doing um, what hy you know, Dr. Veach and others thought could potentially happen, that it was acting as an alternative fuel. And so you know, we looked at, our, you know, uh, at each other about four or five days into this and um, we said, you know, it seems like our life has changed <laughs> for the better. And um, so just to remind you, this is a clock that he drew the day before he started the coconut oil. This is two weeks later. And um, it's uh, pretty messy, but it's a full circle. It has all the numbers there. And um, I, I think the spokes were hands of the clock, <laughs> a lot of them. Um, and then this is a clock that he drew at 37 days after starting coconut oil, and it's considerably cleaned up. It's still a little bit odd. And I think what he was trying to do with those lines was matching up the numbers to straight across. And there's actually a fourth clock, but he never quite finished it. He made several attempts. And what he was doing was he was folding the paper into fourths so he could find the exact center of the paper. And he wanted to draw a perfect circle. And he kept, you know, bunching it up and throwing it away. <laughs> And finally, about the fourth attempt, he wrote on it, they did not give me a compass nor a ruler, and he refused to draw any. He said, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not drawing any more clocks. <clears throat> so my perfectionist uh, accountant <laughs> was back, basically. Um, he didn't do any accounting, though, after that. Um, so here they are, side by side. And um, during this first couple weeks, you know, the first two clocks, I had started talking to Dr. Richard Veach. Um, and I asked him, I didn't tell him what I was doing exactly, and I asked him, theoretically, do you think coconut oil could improve somebody with Alzheimer's disease? And I kind of already knew the answer. And he said, no, no. He said the levels would not even remotely be high enough. Uh, you need to get to five millimoles, he, he thought, to um, help somebody with Alzheimer's disease, and that would require a ketone ester, which he was working on. But uh, when Steve drew the second clock there, I faxed them both clocks, and he called me, and he was utterly amazed. He said he really was surprised and confused and amazed that this could happen. And so he started sending me papers. He um, had Dr. George Cahill and Van Italy call me, Dr. Sammy Hashems, who's also been working uh, with medium-chain triglycerides and working on ketone esters. And they were all um, very happy because here was a person who appeared to be responding to their idea that ketones could work as alternative fuel. So um, Dr. Veach asked, he wanted to find out what his ketone levels were with coconut oil. And so uh, right around a month and a half into doing this, um, we, uh, he, Steve had two doses of coconut oil that were 35 grams each, one at breakfast and one at dinner. And um, Dr. Veach sent his blood work to the I I NIH and 
measured um, acetoacetate levels, which is actually the, the purple line, the top line is glucose. So it's interesting, and this happens with MCT oil and with ketone esters, that when you take them, your glucose level will drop. Um, the middle line is acetoacetate, and the bottom line is beta-hydroxybutyrate. And these are tiny levels. I mean, they're really a minuscule bump up in ketones, you know, on the spectrum of things. Um, but you can see after the dinner dose that his level reached basically a total of about 0.35 um, millimoles, and we don't know where they went from there because they were heading up and we hadn't uh, drawn any more levels after that. Um, so Dr. Veach, a couple weeks later, said, let's do this with MCT oil, and um, Steve is the black lines on the bottom. The uh, red lines are uh, uh, a, a physician, another neonatologist that worked with me who had type 2 diabetes, and he was already on a diet at this point, and he was very interested in this idea, and he had started taking MCT oil himself. So um, he, uh, the physician is the red lines there. And you can see with Steve that um, the black lines, the top of the black lines is actually beta-hydroxybutyrate. The bottom one is acetoacetate, so the reverse of what you saw with coconut oil. And um, it peaked at about 90 minutes. Um, with coconut oil, it had peaked at about three hours and seemed like a little bit longer duration, even though the ketone levels were lower. And, uh, but the, he was back to baseline. Um, by three hours after taking the dose. And um, doctor, what this indicated to Dr. Veach, he said, um, you need to push the MCT oil. He you know, felt the higher levels were important. And um, what it indicated to me was that Steve needed um, it this more, more frequently throughout the day. Um, if the brain runs on uh, ketones, can run on ketones, um, why provide this only for three out of 24 hours a day? So, and then I was also, you know, uh, reluctant to stop giving him coconut oil because he had improved with coconut oil. And I thought, what if there is something else in coconut oil that uh, we don't know about <laughs> that might be contributing to this? So basically, I started giving him a combination. Um, and we uh, started, uh, I uh, initially gave him three doses a day at mealtime and eventually added a fourth dose at bedtime to basically try to keep ketones circulating 24 7. Um, so what we saw over those next few months was really a continuing improvement. Um, by about two months, he could actually pick up his feet and run again and his gait normalized. Um, he hadn't been able to tie his shoes before. At that point, he started being able to tie his shoes. I mean, very simple you know, things that a five-year-old can do. Um, his visual disturbance resolved at about three or four months, and that's when he was able to explain to me what was happening. He, um, you know, the, the words were moving around on the page, and that had stopped at right around three or four months, and he was able to read again, although his comprehension wasn't real well, real good at that point. Um, and instead of taking the tractor apart, he actually started cutting the grass again with it. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> he continued to improve, and in about nine months, um, we saw improvement in his reading comprehension and his recall. And, um, just an instance of what happened, I was, um, I had a doctor appointment and he was in the waiting room and there were magazines, you know, on the table there and about three hours afterwards he said to me, you know, when we were in the doctor's office earlier today, I uh, read in Scientific American an article about Einstein and he told me the details of it and I was pretty flabbergasted because, you know, before we started coconut oil, when we were gardening, Steve couldn't even remember if he was digging a hole or putting the soil back in the hole. <laughs> so, I mean, this was a remarkable improvement um, that he could remember what he had read uh, several hours earlier. <clears throat> so, um, Steve actually did get accepted into the clinical trial, um, and this was, um, he, we decided to do one at Meridian Research, which was very close to where we lived, and it was with Semigasostat, and um, he, um, they, uh, we were aware of it. We told him what had happened to coconut oil and the company decided that um, they couldn't really see how a dietary intervention could confound their results so he could be in the study. <laughs> and once again, we were hopeful that this is something that would help him and that maybe coconut oil just got him to that point. Um, so he had another MMSC score at the point that he entered that study and it was 20 at that point. So it had risen from a low of 12 to a high of 20 um, over a couple months after starting coconut oil. Um, and then he had considerable cognitive testing over that next year. And 
Uh, we didn't know at that time if he was on the drug or not, but we later found out he was actually on the placebo for the first 12 to 14 months. So um, the uh, results that we saw, you know, we could not attribute to that clinical trial drug, but most likely to ketones <laughs> having an impact on Steve. And what we saw was that his, um, over the year, his Alzheimer's disease assessment scale improved by six out of 75 points and his activities of daily living improved by 14 out of 78 points. It's a really pretty dramatic improvement. Um, you know, somebody, um, you know, what, what you would, I, I would see with him is he just had trouble doing things. He had a great deal of trouble doing things and, and now he could do things better <laughs> and take care of himself better. Um, so, <clears throat> back in um, 2004 when he was first diagnosed, he had an MRI that was actually normal. Um, he had other blood work that ruled mm -hmm. out other things, but the MRI was normal. However, by 2008, um, he had an MRI at the start of the clinical trial, and it showed that he had extensive atrophy in the brain, um, and it was moderate to severe, particularly in the areas affected by Alzheimer's. And so um, that uh, you know, was a huge change over a four-year period. So about two years after starting uh, the coconut oil, he had another MRI, and this time it was reported as stable. It was done here at USF, it was, um, and the previous one in 2008 had been done here, and I actually called the radiologist and I said, are you sure? <laughs> and he looked at them again and he told me, yes, I'm sure. You know, um, it's, he hasn't had any further uh, uh, deterioration in his MRI, and, and um, I thought, you know, that's very interesting. I, I don't think that happens very often in Alzheimer's disease. So um, eventually, Steve's um, case study was published, um, and there are actually two parts to the study. And what happened was um, he improved a lot you know, with coconut oil during the first year, and the second year, he seemed to stabilize and really didn't have um, any significant setbacks during that time. However, in the spring of 2010, um, his father died, he became depressed, and he had also, we found out, crossed over, eventually we found out he had crossed over to the drug, semigastostat. And um, one of the reasons we knew that he was on the drug was because his hair started growing out white, and that was one of the known side effects of that drug. Um, they told me at the uh, Meridian Research that they kind of suspected other patients who were on it that they kind of knew because their hair had started uh, growing out gold or white. So um, in February to March of 2010, we were seeing this in Steve. Um, unfortunately, he started having other, much more consequential complications from it. Um, uh, abrasion that wouldn't heal for a month, and uh, if he would nick himself shaving, it, it would bleed for several days, and he fainted, he had other strange things that happened, and we decided to actually withdraw him from the study. Um, and um, that turned out to be fortunate because we learned several months later that the study was stopped because semigastostat was found to actually cause accelerated worsening of Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. <laughs> so Steve was on it for probably five to seven months. We estimate we never found out the exact date. Um, so he had some exposure to it and it probably explained some of the decline that we saw at that point. Um, Steve started having some changes in uh, behavioral <laughs> Uh, things such as um, he had mismatching clothes, putting clothes on backwards, which was uh, something new and happens a lot in Alzheimer's disease. Um, and then I had to start talking him through taking a shower, you know, put the shampoo in your hair, now rub it in, now rinse it out. And this is something that happens in Alzheimer's eventually, you know, with most people, you have to kind of talk them through the personal hygiene before you eventually have to start doing it yourself to help them. Um, so, um, this is what we were seeing, and um, <clears throat> Dr. Veach, you know, had, had maintained close contact with him at that point, and his ketone ester had actually passed toxicity testing and was approved, got GRASS approval from the, the FDA uh, for use in healthy people. Um, so he thought we should do a trial of one, <laughs> again, with his ketone ester, and that was really all he could produce in his lab, you know, was enough to take care of one person. Um, He'd been seeking funding for many years um, for mass production and trials uh, in Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's, but the NIH just wasn't forthcoming and weren't coming up with the dollars. So um, Steve was the beneficiary of um, a uh, single case 
little pilot study of using a ketone ester, and um, Dr. Veach sent this to us, and you know, again, we saw <clears throat> really a dramatic, <clears throat> sorry, a dramatic improvement within 24 hours. Actually, the first dose, I have um, a videotape of Steve. Um, he hadn't been able to really write or write out the alphabet, you know, for a month or two at that point. And he, it took him 20 minutes, and he tried over and over and over, which in and of itself was amazing for somebody with Alzheimer's. But uh, eventually, he wrote out the entire alphabet, said it out loud, and um, during that time, he cursed his first grade teacher for his poor penmanship, <laughs> cursed her by name. I had never heard her name before, which was interesting. And um, he became almost euphoric. He was very happy. Um, it just had, it was interesting, you know, uh, uh, to see the changes. And um, the next day, he pulled his own clothes out of the closet. He put them on, right? Um, he was able to shave and take a shower, all that by himself, you know. So he was kind of, some of the, the more recent changes that we saw had um, reversed back again. And um, we basically got another 20 months of relative stability, you know, out of uh, him being on the ketone ester. So it seemed like the levels at that point of, that we were getting from coconut and MCT oil weren't high enough for what was going on in his brain at the time. But the ketone ester did seem to overcome that, you know, with much higher levels. And um, Dr. Kunain, I mean, he talked about, you know, that, um, you know, basically, um, it's a direct proportion, the blood levels of ketones to the uh, ketone, uh, the energy that's provided in the brain by ketones, you know, so um, if you can provide you know, levels, and we were easily able to get to four to five millimoles in an hour after a dose of, um, you know, about 35 grams, um, you know, that potentially this could provide much more energy to the brain than what we could get. Although I did continue the MCT oil and coconut oil, again, thinking, uh, especially with the coconut oil, that there might be something else to this. Um, so um, it was published in Alzheimer's and Dementia, and then there are other uh, case reports that are popping up, and, and also um, <clears throat> some other, there's a retrospective study now of um, Axona, you know, looking at chart reviews that they did, and they showed about an 80% improvement in, uh, well, a pr an improvement in about 80% of the people who had been given Axona over about an 18-month period. Um, that's uh, one of the um, ones that stand out there. <clears throat> and, um, you know, basically from uh, about two weeks after Steve started taking this, um, I felt like I needed to be a messenger. <laughs> I mean, there are millions of people out there with Alzheimer's, and I felt like I had a big secret, <laughs> you know, that, um, you know, my husband improved, and if he improved, other people with Alzheimer's would improve, and possibly people with Parkinson's and MS and ALS. Um, and so uh, I started writing, writing to politicians, to media people. Um, I was telling them that there's a medical food out there that hasn't been approved yet, but it's available on the shelf. You can get it as coconut oil or MCT oil. Um, my husband's, I know, is only one example of somebody that improved from this, but it needs to be urgently studied. and the people with this disease need to know, you know, that this treatment is out there. And um, basically, I got no response, you know, from anybody. It was very frustrating. And um, uh, even the Alzheimer's Association, I think I, do I have time to tell? <laughs> yeah, so I put together, I wrote an article, and um, this was in July of 2008. And I wanted to go to the International Conference on Alzheimer's in Chicago and have a table and distribute this. And so I sent them a copy of it. They approved the table. I paid them the money. And about three days before the conference, um, I got an email from them saying that they had declined me having a table. And not only that, uh, and I argued back and forth with them, um, but uh, they won. <laughs> And they told me not only could I not have a table, I could come to the conference, but I couldn't distribute my article there. And so that was extremely frustrating. And I did go to the conference. Uh, my sister and her husband came. They stayed with Steve. Actually, my sister uh, surreptitiously handed copies out to people. <laughs> and um, and I, I went to, they have 2,000 poster presentations over uh, five days there, four days, I think. And I talked to everybody who had anything to do with insulin, glucose, uh, nutrition, you know, and I, you know, also handed them copies, which I wasn't supposed to do. And um, I had so many copies left because I had 1,500 of them printed there in Chicago waiting for me. Um, we brought them back and I just started handing them out at health food stores and 
um, sending it out online to anybody who was interested. And um, eventually the St. Petersburg Times picked up on it and they did an article on it. And that's kind of where the message started to get out there. And then um, after talking with Dr. Veach, I felt like um, I needed to write a book. And so I wrote a book about Steve's story um, and about the science of ketones, you know. So it took me about 18 months to write it. I just researched everything I could about the ketogenic diet and, and, and this whole history of ketone research. And um, then, you know, and the third part of it is how to incorporate medium chain triglycerides into the diet. So, um, you know, basically just trying to get the message out so that uh, people with Alzheimer's and these other diseases, you know, can be made aware and you know, it was very disappointing with the Alzheimer's Association. Steve and I went to another uh, conference in um, the spring of 2009. It's every year they go to petition Congress to, for more funding and other, you know, objectives that, that the Alzheimer's Association has. And there were like 500 people there. And they were either people who had, you know, a, a person with Alzheimer's or they worked for an Alzheimer's Association. And so <clears throat> at the breaks, I was passing on my article and uh, Steve was helping me. and. Um, that somebody made an announcement who said, would the people from Florida who are passing out the article stop doing that? <laughs> we don't want people confused about what our agenda is here. And I said, oh, okay, I guess, you know, but um, I argued, you know, with one of them, you know, that, you know, these, these wh why do people need to be protected from this information? You know, especially at the Alzheimer's Association, 5,000 researchers from all over the world. These are MDs, PhDs, um, other people who do Alzheimer's research. And they're bright people. I mean, if this is um, snake oil or this doesn't make any sense, they can judge that for themselves. You know, so I just felt like they were being very overprotective. <laughs> and um, uh, so, you know, that was a little problem that I had there. But um, once it got out um, online, I started hearing back from other people. And um, this was a, a little chart that I put together in 2012. And it's not by any means a scientific study. I think people are more likely to email me if they um, have had an improvement than if they haven't. Um, but I started collecting and just kind of looking at what kind of improvements people um, are uh, seeing. And I didn't prompt them in any way. I just told them, you know, tell me um, uh, what the response was. Even if there was no response, I want to know. And um, just tell me what you saw, you know, as if there were improvements, what did you see? And um, so, you know, most of the, the vast majority of the people who uh, wrote to me, 90-something uh, percent had, uh, had seen a response in their loved one. And about 60 percent saw some type, type of cognitive or memory um, improvement. And about 40 percent some type of uh, improvement like in their social interaction, their mood, their behavior. Um, uh, many people saw improvements in their ability to talk and carry on a conversation um, and just other even physical improvements uh, such as we had seen in Steve. So um, now I have over 400 reports and you know they're basically oh, pretty much in the same vein. And those are just some of the verbatim phrases that people use and I just try to categorize them and like I said it's not really a scientific study. <laughs> So um, after trying to get the word out now for seven years, <laughs> uh, I guess going on eight years, um, uh, back in 2008, there was only one container of coconut oil on my shelf at Publix, <laughs> the local grocery store. And now there are at least 10 brands lined up there and all different sizes. So it's gr very gratifying to me because I do feel like the message is getting out there. <laughs> so, um, you know, if you or your loved one or your patients you know, have uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, neurodegenerative disease. Um, what do you have to lose <laughs> by trying a dietary intervention? And uh, that is Steve, who um, lost his battle. Sorry. <laughs> oh, any questions? <laughs> Valkyrie's powerful. <laughs> 
Thank you. Um, can you tell us more about what sleep I was um, at the beginning of our yeah, um, I became, we, we had a standard American diet up till about 2006. It was atrocious. I call it the convenience diet. <laughs> there were a lot of packaged foods and a lot of fast foods. And, um, you know, um, we talked about this, I think, in another talk at the conference that um, physicians just aren't trained in nutrition. I had three hours, one afternoon of nutrition in four years of medical school. I mean, we're taught biochemistry and what is the fate of, you know, the proteins and the things that we eat, but not, you know, how does nutrition impact disease, you know, for good or for bad. And um, so um, I started getting interested in, you know, possibly that uh, food could be impacting his disease and um, just read everything I could. And right around 2006, we decided to transition to a whole food diet. Um, so we did that first. It was a very kind of Mediterranean diet with whole grains and, you know, colors of vegetables and so that a couple years before we started the coconut oil yeah so he was already um, on a pretty healthy diet at that point um, we had also started um, there was a study uh, that was being conducted with DHA um, the, the omega-3 fatty acid in Alzheimer's disease and it was um, 900 milligrams a day that they were giving and I thought you know this is an essential fatty acid why would I want him to get the placebo so I just started giving him, um, you know, the DHA 900 milligrams every day, and that was also around 2006. So he was on that for a couple of years, but you know he was declining <clears throat> still. And um, in uh, 2000, uh, basically after he started this diet, um, well, right right around the time he was going to start the diet, one thing that he did that was um, <clears throat> stood out was that he was eating a tremendous amount of fruit. <laughs> And I you know, think of it that maybe his brain was craving sugar because he would stand over the sink in the evening, he'd eat 10 or 12 pieces of fruit. And, um, you know, I've talked to other people, you know, uh, who caregivers of people with Alzheimer's and, you know, people who never ate pastries and ate candy bars all day in their life start doing this, you know, when they have this disease sometimes. So um, that was one thing that we were seeing before he started the coconut oil, even though it was healthy food, theoretically, it was just an awful lot of fruit. and. Um, as soon as he started the coconut oil, that went away almost like right away. And then we saw that he um, wasn't, uh, he was leaving the bread from his sandwiches and leaving the uh, rice on his plate or pasta, you know, if we had any pasta. And so he just kind of naturally cut down the carbohydrate on his own in the diet, which was interesting. He was getting a tremendous amount of uh, oil at this point. I mean, we got up to, um, uh, 9, 10, 11 tablespoons a day of a combination of coconut and MCT oil. So he was almost effectively on a ketogenic diet just by virtue of the sheer amount of fat that he had in the diet. And then he uh, had eliminated and I just stopped putting it on his plate then because he wasn't eating it anyway. So he basically had stopped pretty much eating bread and rice and pasta and those kind of things. And um, so, uh, you know, he basically ended up on a low carbohydrate diet. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, have you had any further contact with the Alzheimer's Association? Um, I tried, but <laughs> they. Um, I understand that they are actually funding a study in Canada, and it's with Dr. Kunain. They're going to be looking at mild cognitive impairment and the response uh, as far as prevention of Alzheimer's disease over a three year period of people taking MCT oil. So it seems like they are, um, you know, um, getting, but their, their uh, actual official response is that it hasn't been tested. It hasn't been tested, it hasn't had clinical trials. And, um, you know, people have told me that they've contacted them and said, well, you've had seven years to do this, why haven't you done it? You've known about it during this time. You know, why hasn't it been done? Um, and, and that was basically the response I got when I did talk to their medical director at a conference I told you about where we were told not to <laughs> distribute the, uh, the articles. Um, I talked to their medical director and he said, well, you know, we can't recommend this to people until it's had large clinical trials. And I said, well, who's going to fund a large clinical trial of coconut oil? There's no money in it. You know, and he suggested the Alzheimer's disease cooperative study that they might be interested, but I couldn't. I tried and I couldn't um, get any response from them. 
So, um, you know, I agree, you know, it needs clinical trials, and, but somebody needs to fund it. <laughs> I would love to see it. Um, the Bird Institute is actually doing uh, a study. Um, they started about a year and a half ago. Um, they're using, um, it's a combination of uh, MCT and coconut oil. Uh, Fuel for Thought is the product that they're using. Um, and the study's underway. <laughs> He's got, <laughs> yeah. I was just going to uh, give some additional support to what Mary was reporting about the uh, Bird Institute. Dr. Van Italy, who uh, Mary referred to several times, founded the company that makes Fuel for Thought being studied by the Bird Institute, and to date we have uh, over 5,000 people who use this same results, and we affirmatively ask people what their reports are, so we, it's not scientific in the sense of controlled, but we do have people on evidence base asking them, are you seeing results? have over 90% favorable results with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, MS, ALS, uh, glaucoma, anything that affects the nervous system. So very similar results, but on a much broader basis and very successful. So thank you, Mary. Mm -hmm.